Welcome. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who is my mentor, is the reason I'm here. Uh, I first heard him probably in 1996, and uh, it was one of those moments where I realized that uh, the whole world was going to change. Either what he was saying was basically crazy, or he was a genius. And I had to figure out which one, because you know I wanted to be sure if he was true in what he said, then it was a revolution in medicine, and it changed everything about how I was going to approach my patients. And Jeff's a unique guy because he studied with Linus Pauling. He's a nutritional biochemist, and he has basically been a one-man computer synthesizing data for, I don't know, how many years now? 40 years. <laughs> and every time I see Jeff, he's got a stack of papers in his hand that he reads all the time. So he synthesized data from across specialties, from genomics to immunology to study of the gut and the microbiome. And these concepts he found early in the literature, and he brought them out to clinicians who then began to use them in their clinic. And that really was the origin of functional medicine. And for me, you know, it's been the cornerstone of my practice. In fact, when I was um, learning this, and I basically learned it by listening to tapes of Jeff for hours and hours every day, and usually I had to rewind because I didn't understand what he was saying half the time, <laughs> and it was when they had cassettes. And the concepts now that are commonplace were completely absent in medicine. For example, the microbiome. That was the cornerstone of our approach in functional medicine was addressing the gut and the microbiome. Inflammation, which we now know is linked to obesity and heart disease and cancer, diabetes, dementia. That concept was seminal to the teachings back then. And also, for example, you know, he looked at the mitochondria and things that, that we're now beginning to understand are critical in medicine. He's looking at the idea of detoxification and the role of our detoxification system. These concepts were so far out of medicine, but we began to apply them and see extraordinary results. So Jeff is not just that, but he has held so many positions. He's been the chairman of the Institute and the co-founder of uh, Institute of Functional Medicine. He's runs biotech companies, he started um, Metage he, he became part of Metagenics, a nutritional supplement company, started HealthCom, which began his teaching, and really has been the father of functional medicine. So I'm really pleased to have Jeff Bland here at Cleveland Clinic at Grand Rounds, because he's the reason for all this today. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. That's uh, very gracious, and I, I don't think I can fully accept all of that. Uh, uh, laudable comments, but it's it's a really a privilege to be here uh, with you this morning and to kind of uh, talk ab uh, about the perspective that I think is a way of thinking as much as a way of doing, which is the functional medicine model. So you're going to hear me really uh, kind of emphasize the construct of of how we address questions and how we approach uh, getting answers and and where does truth really reside as it relates to individualizing the treatment of uh, patients. And so it's, uh, it's going to be a little walk down memory lane, but hopefully it'll be walking down the literature that's uh, available today that really supports the construct that underlies a systems uh, biology approach to medicine, which is functional medicine. So let me give a, just a, a, a four little points before I get into my slides uh, as to the overview of what I'm trying to accomplish uh, with you this morning. And uh, this is like the Cliff Notes version, so those of you want to check out after this, you at least got the summary. Uh, so th the first point of my four points is that I think we're moving uh, on a broad scale globally uh, from the age of the average to the age of the individual. And this cuts across many, many different sectors in the public domain, in, in politics and sociology and economics and in information science and in, in medicine, moving from the age of the average to the age of the individual. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because most people in medicine would say, well, hold on, we've been treating the individual, you know, historically. That's what we're up to. So isn't that being a little presumptuous to suggest that, you know, we've, we're suddenly making some transition from the age of the average to the age of the individual? And I'll, I'll move on to my second point, which describes why I'm saying that. The second point is if you ask what is the fundamental um, basis of the nosology of medicine, where did it arise uh, as we would think of it today? What's the philosophical germ seed of uh, the way we think of this combination of inductive and deductive reasoning in medicine? Uh, 
one could argue probably about different points of origin, but I'm going to go back to the beginning of the 19th century because it was a very interesting period of time which we had the, uh, the, the, the field in Germany of statistics being born under Friedrich Gauss. You know, there was no such thing as a Gaussian curve until Friedrich Gauss kind of brought this, this construct out of mathematics. Similarly, with another interesting person who was a savant, um, Florence Nightingale, uh, in the Crimean War. Those of you who have studied her life know that she was... Uh, a genius, uh, clearly, um, and she was the first person to use population statistics for uh, health-related issues, uh, and you know, start aggregating data together in a very um, logical um, way to make decisions about individuals based upon group principles. So the combination of Friedrich Gauss or the field of statistics and that of aggregating that into graphical form forms so you could understand big data from simple pictures was the start really of the founding understanding of uh, what later became the Flexner Report in America that gave rise to scientific the birthing of scientific medicine. Uh, you probably recall in the, in the 20th century, the early 20th century. So that was the kind of curriculum we all went through as students probably, which was, you know, basic science curriculum. You get the math and the physics and the chemistry and the, and the biology and, you know, biochemistry, and then you're trained to be ready to be a doctor. And it's all this kind of logical uh, extension of taking information from groups and distilling it down into understanding how to classify a patient. That's called di differential diagnosis. Um, that model, which we would call individual medicine, is really built on a statistical basis of group, group aggregation. And so we, we, we treat from a statistical norm. And I learned in 1974, actually, in a meeting that I attended in, in Houston, it was a foundation founding meeting of the American Society of uh, Preventive Medicine, and Linus Pauling spoke there, and, uh, and Roger Williams, who was the head of the nutrition department, or actually biochemistry at University of Texas. And he made, Williams made a very interesting point in his talk. He said, nutrition is for real people. Statistical humans are of little interest. Now that stuck so strongly in my central nervous system that I've never been able to escape from it since. That was 1974. Because I recognized that I had spent a lot, a lot of time actually studying statistical humans, right? And yet, probably in practice, you would never see a statistical human. You would see individual people who bring individual backgrounds and individual issues that may not fit directly into the midst uh, of a Gaussian curve. So that's an underlying principle that we incorporate within functional medicine, which differentiates what I call individualized therapy from a statistically based approach to aggregate into, into personal medicine. I hope you kind of get the differentiation. So my third point then, uh, is the, the theme that functional medicine is less concerned about what we call it and more concerned about where it came from. Now, that's a simple thing to say in English, but it's a more complex thing to really figure out what we mean. Because it takes us around, uh, beyond the differential diagnosis. The differential diagnosis, now we move into the uh, ICD codes, you know, and we used to be have the ICD-9s, and, and then suddenly now we have the ICD-10s, you know, and we thought we knew all this stuff about disease, and then suddenly in ICD-10s, we have three times as many diseases. So what does it say we really knew about disease? It says, well, maybe it's a work in progress. Maybe as we get into segmental analysis and we get more differentiated understanding that there are many forms of diabetes, many forms of heart disease, many forms of whatever disease, when you start cutting it into smaller sections to individualize it, that the construct of disease is almost like the infinitesimal in calculus. You follow what I'm saying? that eventually you have so many different cuts of a disease that the, the name of the disease is not even important anymore. It's really more of what that individual has. So that's my third point, is that we're going to be talking less about inorgan pathology and more in functional medicine about how genes interact with the environment, because that's the plasticity upon which one can actually generate a modifiable intervention for that person. It's actionable if you understand that relationship. Now, I don't want to be so presumptuous to say that we know everything we need to know about either genes or environment or how they interact, but I want to say that that's the birthing of a new paradigm. That's because we now have the, the capability of measuring things and understanding things at that interaction of a genomic uniqueness with the environment, lifestyle, diet, and background of that person in ways that we never could know before based upon the, the development of technology, information science, uh, all the kinds of uh, what we call um, 
enriched data clouds that are going to travel around with each one of us that we can access uh, and carrying our own medical record or health record with us. So this is a new age. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradigm shifting uh, time in history. My last point is, so what is functional medicine? Then? If it uh, is more uh, focused on, on how you got there than what you call it, then what is its point of, of differentiation in, in logic? The logic tree would suggest, and I'm going to, this is where I'm going to go into the slides, this is the longest you know, introduction you've probably ever heard, um, <laughs> is that the nature of what we have historically done is to apply to memory a variety of algorithms that allow us to recite on demand specific types of descriptors. That's medical education, really. There's a lot of memory, isn't there? A lot of memorization and recitation and being drilled. Um, to the point that sometimes we lose the skill of the, of the neuronal plasticity to start interconnecting things together in ways that would make maybe more sense for the patient. Now, I'm not trying to be accusatory and I'm not trying to be dismissive of the power of medical education. It's hugely valuable. But it does create a, a, a way of thinking that can often then uh, reduce our ability to have inductive reasoning in its full expressed potential. So where does disease really start if there is such thing as a disease? And that's a whole other question that we could talk about. Um, but it starts with dysfunction. There is not a single ICD-10 that you cannot say has some underlying dysfunction. Now, even traumatic injury probably had some precipitating events that led to it. And people say you need three things to go wrong at the same time to create an unexpected tragedy, right? So what are those precipitating events, those triggers, as we call them in functional medicine, that uh, al allow the appearance, then, of what we ultimately uh, call a diagnosis? And so dysfunction is a precedent of pathology. That's an underlying theme of function of functional medicine. Now, what does dysfunction mean? And here is an interesting, uh, I think, ter terminology because dysfunction can occur at multiple levels that are all holographically interconnected. Those levels can be obviously physiological dysfunction, which we can measure by disturbed molecules. It can be physical dysfunction, which we can measure in physical medicine how a person moves, acts, and behaves, and flexibility, and all the endurance, and all those things. It can be cognitive dysfunction, or it could be psychological dysfunction. It could be spiritual lost your way. All of those are potentially measurable components of what ultimately arises together in an aggregate to become the individual, how they are seen, they're looked at, and feel in the world. And that is a result of how their world their environment, starting at the moment of conception and maybe even preconception, influences how their genes are going to be expressed into the world in which they have found themselves. That's a very different model of disease, by the way, than the way I learned it, which was a pathophysiologically based model based on the end point and then going back. This is starting from the beginning and going forward. So those are the four points. I hope I've kind of described the difference. So we're less concerned about taxonomy and we're more concerned about ecology. Let me say it again. Taxonomy is kind of naming stuff, like Linnaean, you know, species and genus. Uh, and, and we're really good at that in medicine, naming stuff. But the real question is, what does it mean once we've named it? Where did it come from? How does it manifest? What's its origin? In the past, uh, addressing those questions, as was told to me by my, my medical school professor in 1967, was you're going to have a lifetime to explore that question, Jeff. Just learn the stuff and, and recite it on demand. Well, my lifetime now at 71 years of age is that we have had now many years to explore this, and there are new tools and new observations. In fact, when I was in medical school, virtually none of the chronic diseases had known mechanisms of their origin. That's not the case today. Four plus decades later, we have some pretty robust explanations for the etiology of many chronic diseases. And we recognize the variegated forms in which they appear in patients with the same diagnosis. That's the new opportunity to leverage that knowledge into the creation of a different way of thinking about the patient as to how they, on their journey of life, got to that point where they're in the clinic and asking for remediation. So with that as my long-winded introduction, now I promise you I will spend less time on each of the slides going forward. So what are, what are the objectives of what I'd like to share with you? Really, um, three objectives. I'd like to talk about systems biology and how it applies to medicine. 
Uh, I'd like to talk about the conceptual framework of functional medicine built out of the concept of systems biology. And then I'd like to explain how functional medicine represents an operational system that allows us to implement systems biology thinking uh, in the management of chronic disease. And I want to I want to differentiate between acute disease, which often a very rote model is what you need in the emergency room. You're not going to spend you know hours putting together a complex puzzle probably about that patient. You're going to de deal with the triage in the moment, and therefore there is a very good place to use kind of differential diagnosis, immediate response, kind of uh, disease pathology focused intervention. But in the chronic state, which is complex, that model may less be applicable to uh, achieve the benefits for improving patient outcomes. So I'm not saying one system is wrong and the other is right. I'm saying there's an aggregation of thinking using the right tool at the right place, whereas they say, if all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. So now we want to increase the, the size of the toolkit to uh, provide different ways of approaching different problems. Okay, what are my disclosures? None that I'm aware of, other than the fact I have uh, five grandkids and a wife who holds me accountable and I travel too much, but other than that. Uh, <laughs> so um, let, let's move on to some of the background information. First of all, we recognize that we have a society in the United States that has complex chronic disease as a common burden. In fact, 75% of our healthcare expenditures now go into managed chronic disease. Uh, this particular recent article in JAMA talks about that we need to foster health systems that will allow us to address this rising uh, burden of chronic disease. We need to empower individuals to be part of their healing. Uh, we need to equip clinicians to have more lifestyle-based uh, uh, consultation because a lot of these disorders associate with uh, altered lifestyle and environmental concerns. We need to have education and training to, to get uh, people involved in their own uh, healing. And we need to enhance patient-centered outcome-based research. This is all kind of fundamental to the functional medicine model. Now, where did this all start for us? For me, personally, it started in 1980 with this paper that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine by the then head of rheumatology at uh, Stanford Med School, uh, James Fries, who wrote this, what I consider, landmark paper. We probably all have our favorite papers, you know, and for me, I've, I've cited this literally thousands of times, I'm sure, over the years. This is entitled, Aging, a Natural Death, and the Compression of Morbidity. And uh, I could get, go on a long waxing discussion about Fries, but let me just summarize it. He came up with a very important observation. He said that disease, and, and from a rheumatology perspective, was associated with increasing morbidity over time, and it was associated with the loss of organ reserve. That when we're born, every animal, humans and others, has a reserve of organ function beyond that you require for homeostasis, somewhere between four and seven fold the, above the reserves that, uh, reserve that you need just to maintain basic low, low level function. But uh, a unifying principle to animal behavior or animal physiology is over time, your reserve in organs, be it your liver ability to detoxify, your cardiovascular function to be able to handle stress, or your brain to be able to handle new complexity, uh, it, it's lost over time. But the rate of loss is not the same in all people. And in fact, there are some that have very steep loss of, of function over time, and other people have very slow rates of loss. So biological aging, he proposed, is really con connected to maintenance of organ reserve. The good no news of the story is he said by practicing the right thing in your life, you can not only retard the rate of loss of organ reserve, but you can actually regain organ reserve if you practice the right things. This was the implication of this paper. Thereby compressing morbidity in but the last few moments of your life, leading to natural death and extending your life expectancy to that of that of your life opportunity, your lifespan, right? So this was a very, at the time, uh, heretical model, I might say, to the way medicine was thinking about aging and illness. And it received tremendous amount of uh, controversy. In fact, I, I don't recall any paper that I've ever seen in the New England Journal of Medicine, having followed it now for 40 plus years, that had more letters to the editor of response to this article. Because they said, well, this is a theory without proof, and you know, you know, who knows if this is true, and all sorts of interesting countervening um, discussions. In that particular paper, he provided this model. This is a model that many of us have used. It's certainly a fundamental foundation of functional medicine. That over time, we have declining function, right? This is the standard curve that you see for people as they grow older. In age, their percent vitality decreases. This is like a standard. We all believe this is true. And in fact, if you look at the risk factor for virtually every disease, what will be one of the risk factors? Aging. 
But it really begs the question, what is aging? How does aging r relate to the risk factors of these disease? Is it aging or is it some biological process underlying suboptimal function that gives rise to these conditions? So then he proposed that actually there would be a way of rectangularizing the survival curve so that you lived out to the limit of your biologically set uh, life and you just kind of had a uh, silent in the night moving on to the next regime, right? You didn't have a long period of disability, the compressing morbidity. Now, this is what some people call the blue zone today. <clears throat> These are the places in the world where people live to be centenarians. They work out in the fields. They seem to have very little medical uh, high technology intervention. And then they just suddenly wear out and they expire at, after 100. <clears throat> so what is it that relates to how one then compresses morbidity and uh, attains this concept of natural death? So he and his uh, associate, uh, Dr. Crapo at uh, Stanford, <clears throat> some 18 years later, did a follow-up study to this model uh, with alumni from um, uh, Penn, or the University of Pennsylvania, looking at what was their life experience as they aged over 40 years. Those people that self-elected to be involved in a N of one study in their life to eat right, think right, act right, and be right, what was their outcome? And on average, 14 years later, onset of chronic disease symptoms and <clears throat> three and a half years longer life span, uh, life expectancy. So they said, you know, our model is just not theoretic. There are things here to say that it's real in the way that people treat themselves and how they, what their outcome is over the course of living. So this is the gene environment age, right? And uh, there are many, many papers talking about this genetic variation among healthy people that more than 3 million single nucleotide polymorphisms have, have been discovered. We're not sure how many of those are really material for modulating our function, but some percentage of them are. These are the kind of uh, operative uh, gene polymorphisms that really may affect then how a person's response to their environment influences their health over living. And we then might see these as the uh, actionable areas in a person's genealogy that would, uh, under certain conditions of their behavior, lead to improved outcome. Like, for instance, let's take an example that's very trivial, gluten, right? If a person has uh, genes that relate to that molecule that's found in grains, which is part of the grain protein, for which their body sees it as a foreigner based on their unique uh, HLA antibody response, then for them, that's not a good thing. So you individualize to that particular characteristic by modifying their environment, and then you compress morbidity. That's the model. So what is this all about? It's all about regulomes. <laughs> this is an interesting term, because within this complex matrix of over 25,000 coding genes that appear in our genome, are certain what I call uh, genetic hotspots. These are, uh, in fact, some people call these genetic acupuncture points. They're the, the places where you have the switching yards of many genes that are regulated by specific upstream uh, operational units within the, the genome. And if you can um, speak to those regulating uh, areas, those regulating intersects, like insulin signaling, inflammatory signaling, uh, cell mitotic activity, that you can then downstream affect many, many different processes at the phenotype. So these are called the regulomes. And so how do you know where these regulomes really reside and how do you interface with them in an individual to modulate their function over life so that they resist disease and they increase function? So in this article, they talk about the regulation of genetic expression may arise from epigenetic differences, meaning things that are above the genes, right? Epigenetic, meaning things that relate to imprinting of the genes with, uh, with uh, things like methylation or acetylation, ubiquinitation of the genome that then allows only certain portions of your book of life to be expressed under those conditions, right? It could be either good stories or it could be not so good stories, depending on where these epigenetic marks are, are found. And those are related to environmental factors such as lifestyle, diet, microbiome, drugs, and toxic exposure. So this is a, you know, kind of, in some sense, a manifesto of what we think about for functional medicine. So as you probably know, um, this, this model has been woven forward then in what we call a systems thinking about the, uh, the etiology of disease, or what I call omics-derived systems biology. This is Eric Topol's wonderful uh, paper that appeared uh, in the uh, journal Cell a few years ago, talking about this landscape of various types of disciplines within biosciences that really works together as a hologram to describe human health with a new kind of perspective. So we could think of it as the exposome, 
Um, Dr. Hyman has spoken, and Dr. Hanaway both, about what that means. I mean, all the things that are exposed, that we're exposed to, that we have uh, antennae, receptors out in the, uh, in the environment sampling our, our universe that then signals through all these different uh, levels, the epigenome, the microbiome, the uh, transcriptome, into the metabolome, into the kinome, into the lipidome, and ultimately into our phenotype, right? So all these variable ways that you can look at the individual feature set of a person's function based upon new tools that are accessible only within the last, say, 10 years to get this information. Well, I have the fortune of being in Seattle, Washington and, and being a, a colleague of uh, the director and founder of the Institute for Systems Biology, Dr. Lee Hood, who really kind of coined this term, and I could go on effusively to talk about Dr. Hood, who uh, is uh, arguably been credited as, as developing the three instruments that were central to the deciphering the human genome. Um, he, as you probably know, he was brought from Caltech by Bill Gates and set up at the University of Washington School of Medicine with a $100 million grant and, and then as a consequence of other things that happened, ended up uh, with his own institute and, and lots of interesting stories. But uh, Lee and I have really been uh, talking quite a bit uh, with his colleague, Dr. Nathan Price, who will, I understand, be here to be doing a Grand Rounds coming up uh, following me, so I'm, I'm kind of the warm-up guy for, uh, for, for Dr. Price. Um, and through this, this construct, uh, Dr. Hood uh, has come up with what he calls P4 medicine, which really connects very closely together with functional medicine. And he says there are four characteristics of this P4 medicine, four Ps, preventive, um, personalized, predictive, and participatory. And that last P is very important, and I'm sure all of you here at the Functional Medicine Clinic uh, are recognized. If you don't get a person to participate in their own process, this model doesn't work because you have to be, it has to be a collaborative model in, in which the person takes some responsibility for their own life and their own health. So what is uh, systems biology then as it applies to four P's in functional medicine? Well, Alberto uh, Barabasi, I think, beautifully said it in this uh, article in New England Journal of Medicine. Some of you know of his pioneering work in really starting to uh, develop the, uh, the I, I would call the algorithms, the, uh, the high-level com computational thinking as to how you take all this information and put it together into data-rich clouds for which we can then interrogate that person's complexity based upon this information set. So he wrote this article in, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, and you probably have seen this article because uh, it's one of the fundamental teaching models in functional medicine, entitled um, Network Medicine from Obesity to the Disease Zone, in which he tries to demonstrate that there are these various levels of how we interrogate a person's basis from a functional perspective, starting off, uh, if you would, with their genomic and, and microbiomic uh, uh, kind of information, and then moving on from that into the metabolomic information, something about biomarkers and, you know, how we measure stuff in the blood, to then moving on to the sociogenomics. And I know Dr. Hyman has spoken uh, considerably about this, that social networking and who you hang out with and your nearest neighbors influence then how these things uh, from your genome get ultimately translated into your phenome. So it has to be a complete concatenation of all these various factors together to form a functional medicine interrogation system. You can't just look at one level. You have to look at these levels together. Now, why is it that this system has taken so long to kind of gain some stickiness? I think because you'll notice that I'm talking about complexity. Um, it, it actually is easier to just memorize a, a laundry list of different signs and symptoms and come up with a differential diagnosis. I don't want to trivialize things, but, but that is a, a little bit simpler than having this complexity in which you're saying, you mean I got to learn all this stuff and I could go back and restudy my immunology and my biochemistry and my, you know, genomics and genetics and, and then I have to compile that with the complexity of patient behaviors and understand sociology and psychology and, and the answer is yes. <laughs> there's no way of getting around it because that is what our central nervous system is capable of doing and that is the solution to many of these problems is, is, uh, is integrating this information to together in ways that really make sense. But fortunately, we do have a tool today that we didn't have 25 years ago, personal computing. Now on our wrists reside these little devices that are as powerful or in our pocket with our smart devices uh, as powerful as a Cray supercomputer was uh, uh, 15 years ago in which it can aggregate information. We don't have to store all that in our brain. What we have to use is our inductive and deductive reasoning in ways to assemble this information into logical conclusions. So the body systems are interconnected, and the, what you probably have seen is that um, you take all the diseases in a map, and you recognize that these diseases are interconnected. 
through their shared common functional disturbances, and we're going to talk more about this in a moment. Similarly, as people are connected in the, in the, uh, to the right, in their own social networks into different ways. So you can aggregate in different ways and think in, not in pathways, but think in networks. So we're not a combination of pathways. We are a complex network working in real time, interfacing with our environment to create an outcome called our function. That is a very different model than the histopathology basis driving for a differential diagnosis on an ICD-10 for reimbursement than I learned. So with that in mind, we're entering then a new era of healthcare, right? That's built around this new available logic and information. That is, it's a precision and personalized form of healthcare. And the concept of precision prevention is valuable for effectively targeting preventive strategies for individuals who really need it. Because not, not everyone needs to be on a low salt diet. Not everyone needs to be on a low fat diet or whatever the model is that we use in a public health sense may not be individualized to the optimal need of that particular person. Or saying it another way, there's no perfect diet for everybody. As any more than there's a perfect exercise program for everybody or a perfect uh, uh, social environment for everybody. There's all sorts of variations on a theme that gives rise to the robustness of the plasticity of the human, is all these various ways that we express ourselves. So this article that appeared in the New England, in JAMA, really kind of got my attention. It's called the 10 to get one rule. And uh, I'll just quote, because I think they say it better than I could say it. They say, the need for a change has been apparent for some time. They're talking about medical therapeutics and how we apply pharmacology. While group-wise comparison of outcomes in randomized trials provides the rationale for the FDA approval of medications, it is often found that a minority of the study participants drive this effect. Or saying it another way, if you take 10 subjects in a traditional randomized clinical trial for a drug approval, one of those is the driver individual with very great outcome that drives statistics into being P005 or less. Why do you think we have in some of these conditions such huge drug trials? It's not just solely for the uh, exploration of safety, it's to get the levels to statistical significance because the treatment effect is so small that you have to have huge data sizes in order to get them to significance. So this construct that, uh, you know, when you give a drug, you get the same outcome it is totally specious. I mean, anyone in practice knows that. But probably we don't understand the variation of response that appears uh, uh, among a population uh, using a therapeutic that's been approved. Or saying it, a way, saying it another way, genotypic information is only powerful if the phenotypic information is present. So we, we know the gene, but we have to know the, how the person is responding to this, uh, the signal that comes from their environment. So this is the, uh, the functional medicine revolution. It's a combination of what I call precision personalized healthcare with the P4 concept as an operational system to systematize systems biology and healthcare. That's, that's kind of how I see functional medicine emerging. So what are the defining principles of functional medicine? You've heard this time and time again, so I don't probably need to spend much time on there. It's patient-centered versus disease-focused. It's uh, systems biology-focused using web-like interactions versus pathway kind of logic. It is dynamic interaction between genes and the environment that's happening every moment of our life, including right now. Your genes are sampling this information that you're being exposed to from the auditory frequency of my voice and the lighting and the temperature and all the, the association with your colleagues. All that is information being processed that's giving rise to altered ways that your genes will respond in the uh, expression of that information. Um, health is a positive vitality, not merely the absence of disease. That's a powerful concept, by the way, that I could spend quite a bit of time talking about, but I think it's probably self-evident. And lastly, physiological, physical, cognitive, and emotional function is where the focus is not just on the endpoint that we call pathology. So we quantify wellness and illness using the functional medicine operating system, this, this tree-like metaphor, everybody has their tree. Uh, our roots are in the soil of our environment. They're mod modulating our, the way our genes are expressed, which gives rise ultimately to our function that's seen in the, in the leaves and the branches and the, and the uh, limbs of the tree up, up above. And we've got a lot of uh, people who are very good at diagnosing when the leaves don't look very good, but we need sometimes to go down into the soil to understand what is the origin of the problem. So what are the characteristics of functional medicine that differentiate it from a histopathology-based drive towards a sine qua non called a diagnosis, a, a disease? And that is we look at the antecedents, the triggers, the mediators, 
and then how they influence the severity, frequency, and intensity of the signs and symptoms that the patient uh, is expressing or experiencing. So how does that differ? Once again, just to emphasize, we're more concerned as to how the patient got there versus what you call it when they got there. That's the basic model difference between uh, the two as I, would, as I would envision it. So we have the functional medicine matrix, which is this clinical algorithm. And again, I could spend a lot of time going through the various subsets of this algorithm. Just suffice it to say, this is kind of the learning tool. This is the clinical uh, way that we, uh, we, we, we send the information to the patient through this lens <laughs> called the functional medicine matrix that allows us to understand, hopefully, uh, more the pattern recognition of how these things aggregate uh, to individualize the patient need. So there are seven core physiological processes that we've identified within the matrix. Um, uh, these are the, the kind of constructs that uh, allow us to have operational and uh, quantifiable uh, subsets of uh, characteristics that a patient experiences. And each one of those seven uh, physiological core processes has a body of literature associated with it, not only individual as a silo, but interconnected to the other six. So you've got this, this web-like interaction of these seven core physiological processes. And they look like this, and, and you probably have all seen this, uh, again, multiple times. Um, assimilation, uh, uh, elimination, that's a uh, gastrointestinal function. Uh, detoxification that uh, Mark was talking about. Immune uh, function. Uh, cellular communication, these are things like apolipoproteins and hormones and things that, that uh, communicate action at a distance, uh, basically from one part of the body to another. Um, Cellular transport, which are things that actually move things around, like glucose transport, lipid transport, protein transport. So you have dysfunctions at each of those levels that we can identify when you uh, drill deep down into understanding physiology. Um, energy, uh, bioenergetics, uh, this uh, uh, Dr. Hyman alluded to with uh, mitochondrial function that appears in, uh, in every cell of the body that's actively involved with converting food to energy. And uh, some of you know that uh, the cardiocyte, for instance, 75% of the volume of the cardiocyte is occupied by mitochondria. So it's chocked filled of these energy powerhouses. So any functional tissue that's constantly producing work, uh, like neurons, are <laughs> heavily mitochondrially rich. And so they depend upon the fuel. They depend upon this wire called the electron transport chain. And then the patency of all those things that uh, come out as high energy intermediates and how they ultimately regulate function. And there's many ways that we're now seeing pathology uh, at different levels, chronic and acute pathology in that process. And then lastly, but not least, is structure. I mean, I used to think of the skeleton as this thing in the anatomy lab that was uh, kind of dead hanging over there on a, on a clothes hanger. But now we recognize, of course, that the skeleton is an active part of our function. Uh, it has the marrow versus all the white and red blood cells. It has uh, WNT signaling things that communicate to, to other tissues of the body. It's interregulated with uh, adipocyte function and, and uh, how that and then ultimately you can have fat bones and fat bodies and all sorts of things that we're now recognizing that structure and function are intimately woven together. You can't separate one from the other. This is uh, the philosophical, you know, angels on the head of a pin type argument. They're all working together and communicating. So we are really looking at a different kind of model, a model that really is focused on function, not just in pathology. Some people would call this wellness. Wellness is a kind of a squishy term. Uh, we're uh, in the process of really trying to make wellness scientific because now the uh, information I'm describing allows us to quantify many of the things that were before just kind of qualitative and, and not well described. Uh, disease is incompatible with is uh, incompatible with health, but not wellness. You can you can have a cancer patient who is well or not well, right? And probably relapse rates post-cancer therapy is somewhat related to the wellness quotient of that patient after they've gone through treatment. That's maybe uh, kind, of an, uh, kind of a contradiction in terms, but we're starting to recognize that disease and wellness are not actually the same. They're not sides of the same coin. There are different characteristics that are associated with them. Less is known about what contributes to wellness and what causes disease, says this, says this article in JAMA. The time is ripe for engaging people in the promotion of their own wellness. This is a quote from this, uh, this JAMA paper. 
So that's what I've been involved with with Dr. Hood. We, uh, I was a member of the Pioneer 100 study where 105 uh, people were involved in the pilot program. I think Toby Cosgrove was one of these 105. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe that's speaking out. But uh, uh, we all had a chance to have, in my case now, more than 3 million different data points taken on me over the last two and a half years. Um, as kind of a pilot to assemble information as to what would this robust uh, data-rich cloud really look like and how would it inform uh, a 71-year-old guy as to how to modulate his life going forward. So this is what the uh, Pioneer 100 program looked like. We took all this kind of uh, data from the microbiome every quarter. We had our gut microbiome analyzed. We had our, obviously, genome sequenced. Uh, we had all these uh, functional uh, parameters uh, measured. We had uh, various biometrics done. We wore our, our wearable devices that went to the cloud. And all of that information then gets assembled into, uh, ultimately into the um, uh, laptop of a, count, uh, a coach. Uh, we each had our own individual coach that helps us to interpret this information. And I need to say, as a guy who has measured his blood chemistries every quarter for 27 years, you might say I would have very little to learn. I learned a tremendous amount, actually, about myself through this process that I would consider valuable assets in navigating my forward progress. So I, I can see information as power, and if you can get information in the right construct that can be delivered and communicated effectively, it can have great value. So Michael Snyder, who is the head of genet genetics department at Stanford, was the first guy to have his, uh, what he calls, quantified self done. He's the N one experiment of himself. I don't know if you've read uh, Dr. Snyder's book. Uh, it's a really great primer uh, called The Genomic Revolution. It's just a, about a 150-page book that really gives you a lot of extraordinary news to use about this revolution. Uh, but uh, Mike uh, has been quantifying. Uh, he's probably had, I think, over $3 million of laboratory testing done on himself over the last five years. He is the first quantified human in which he's been measuring how he feels. As you, as you probably know, if you know his story, he actually went into becoming a diabetic during the course of this because he got a viral infection and he got on metformin and he followed his whole web of interacting uh, ohms over this period of time and he res resolved by increasing his exercise and changing his diet and he resolved his diabetes, got off metformin. All of that is quantified. It's all been published actually in Nature. Uh, so this was a very interesting exercise to actually examine from the theory translation into the practice of an individual. Now, not everyone's going to have $3 million of lab tests, right? So uh, let's be realistic. But someone has to pioneer uh, an understanding of where the real stuff might lie out of this big data set. Where are the real operationally important things to be understanding and measuring? So we're in the era of predictive analytics. Uh, predictive analytics incorporates complex information about the patient into this prognostic model. Physicians, it goes on to say in this JAMA paper, must understand limitations of information that result in predicting risks versus benefits of specific therapies. Now let me say something about risks. I think this is a very important term because everything that we think about as it relates to omic information has been contextualized in terms of risk. Now, what does risk mean? It's a disease-based model. It's a pathophysiologically-based model. It is a model, I would suggest, is built on fear. Why do people not want their genetic information? Because they're fearful that they will learn what disease they're going to die from. Now, let me make a point here. This is a philosophical point, but I'm going to stand with it, and uh, I'll be measured by this. I believe... As we learn more about genomics, we're going to find that out of these 25,000 coding genes and out of the huge amount of dark matter that's uh, in what used to be called junk DNA, which is not junk DNA at all, it's operationally important executive centers that regulates through various types of uh, small RNAs and other uh, tran uh, transcription uh, elements, regulates how genes are expressed. That's what's in our dark matter. It's actually what really separates us from our close relative, 97.6% homologous genes of the chimpanzee. It's not our gene genes that code for protein. It's a non-coding dark matter. In all of that information, you will find that there are many, many more functions that regulate health than regulate disease. Why are we always focusing on disease risk? Why aren't we focusing on the functional attributes that give rise to our ability to be resilient against a changing environment. And by the way, that's what Eric Schott 
and Stephen Friend are doing, as you probably know. They have the Resilience Project. They have turned this whole thing around the other way. They're saying, let's not just look for disease risk, let's look at our genome as it relates to those individuals who have a vast family history. Their fathers, their uncles, their grandfathers, or grandmothers all had specific diseases and they have a strong lineage to being diseased, yet they live in the 90s and they're completely healthy. What is about them that allows to confer in their ability of function resilience against disease when they are already marked with what appear to be bad genes. And by the way, I hate the term to, to put any kind of marker on genes as bad or good. Genes are unique to the way a person responds to their environment. And what may be considered a bad gene at one period of history may have been a good gene for survival at another period of history. So it's a, it's a way actually of discrimination when we start talking about, oh, you have a, a disease risk gene. We should be talking about you have a unique genetic history that then asked us what environment is optimal for its expression. Okay, so this is converting the at-risk patient to the resilient human. This is the resilience project of a friend and, and shot. They say there are 127 Mendelian single gene, gene diseases, but those are very infrequent in our population, as you know. There are over 5,000 non-Mendelian diseases with different susceptibilities. Converting the at-risk patient to the resilient patient is related to epigenetic effects those are operational things you can do. How you think, act, and look, and feel in the world is determined then by things you're actually doing that are actionable. And this concept of disease adjacencies and comorbidities, I would consider those languages that are going to be defunct in the American medical lexicon. Because it suggests that these the conditions that interrelate one with the other, like a woman who presents with osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, and rheumatoid arthritis in the same person, that there are disease adjacencies or comorbidities, that only just begs the question, is there a singular underlying feature that's associated with those three conditions? And as we learn more about the etiology of dysfunction, we learn that discriminating into the siloed concept of subspecialty medicine loses its clarity. So morbidity or disease adjacent, uh, comorbidity or disease adjacency really doesn't exist. And I use this JAMA article to really describe it. Uh, this is uh, talking about the rank rankle system. You know, some of you know about Dumasabob, this uh, drug for osteoporosis, um, uh, which is uh, associated with uh, um, uh, the rankle system in bone. But it turns out that if you look at this uh, closely, you'll find that that, that, that uh, chemical, me that messaging system, that cell signaling mechanism, the rank rankle system, this is receptor of NF kappa B ligand, rankle, that it is expressed, those genes are expressed in immune cells that are associated with arthritis, in bone cells that are associated with osteoporosis, and with vascular endothelial cells that are associated with cardiovascular disease. So what do you think that the drug companies are going to do to develop uh, an, an immune active rankle blocking agent? They're going to say, hey, we'll start off with our first beach beachhead being osteoporosis, and then we'll do maybe a, a, a future approval for cardiovascular disease, and then we'll move on into arthritis. Because these diseases share common lineages as it relates to their dysfunction. Treating the cause rather than the effect is the future of where we're going. That's functional medicine. Let me give you another example from Nature Medicine. This is a, a really interesting one, talking about airwave diseases. So this is uh, uh, things like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Is the gut connected to the lungs, <laughs> is the question. And the answer is yes. Uh, GPCR, this is um, G protein couple receptor 41, uh, which is in the gut mucosa, is activated by dietary fiber to signal then through bone marrow immune cells to the lungs to modulate chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That's what this article tells us. So who owns this? Does a gastroenterologist own this? Does an immunologist own this? Does a pulmonologist own this? And the answer is, no one, no subspecialty medicine owns it. It's part of a system of dysfunction that treating the gut can treat the lungs. Mm -hmm. So germs and joints, you've seen this. This is again from, uh, from uh, Nature Medicine recently, the contribution of human microbiome to uh, rheumatoid arthritis. This was published last year. Or the oral and gut microbiome being perturbed in rheumatoid arthritis and partly normalized after treatment. 
I, I can find hundreds of examples. I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg here as to this new thinking that is uh, aggregating information together in a new way of, uh, of approaching it. And then, of course, the wild card, which is food, which modulates genes, right? The Predimed uh, cardiovascular study in Spain, uh, the largest uh, clinical trial ever done in controlling diet and looking at the effect on cardiovascular disease risk factors and, uh, and uh, looking at uh, metabolic syndrome, showing significant changes in cardiovascular functional outcome with people who elect to have a low glycemic Mediterranean diet with nuts and olive oil. Or how do disease and diet interrelate to premature death to heart disease, in which 50% of heart disease has now been associated with faulty diet, according to a recent JAMA paper last year, or actually that's this year, 2017. Or what about personalized nutrition and the complex diet gene interaction? This is the lead cover article in the top cellular biology journal in the world. Everyone wants to be published in this if you're a cell biologist. And what was the cover article? and the editorial, will diet and exercise save us going forward? Saying we now have the mechanistic understanding of how important these variables are in modulating gene expression into a healthy phenotype, that this should be the focus of where we're taking our science. So I'll close by this last little example. Genes plus diet and lifestyle equals cardiovascular health or disease. You probably saw this paper in New England Journal. It's a blockbuster paper published in the uh, uh, January issue this year of looking at genetic genes, uh, risk genes. So these are, have been uh, taken from the GWAS studies, 88 different genes that have high penetrance into cardiovascular disease. So they analyzed these 88 genes in, in four different studies, over 55,000 people. They also analyzed their lifestyle. They broke down their lifestyle on different principles. So here are the genes used in the risk analysis. And each one was given a score, a weighting factor, whether it was monoallelic or, or biallelic. They got a, a risk score based upon each of these 88 genes. Then they assigned their lifestyle to one of four different risk categories, from high risk to low risk, based upon their diet and their exercise patterns and their sleep and the lack of smoking. So you have an indicator, a, me a metric for lifestyle, an indicator and a metric for gene risk. And then they did a comprehensive analysis and what was the conclusion? The conclusion was many observers assume that a, a, assume that a genetic predisposition to coronary artery disease is deterministic. However, genetic risk is attenuated by a favorable lifestyle such that the people with the highest genetic risk factor scores could mod modulate the appearance into the phenotype of cardiovascular disease by 50% if they elected a healthy lifestyle. So it's not genes only, it's not lifestyle only, it's a mix of genes and environment. That is functional medicine. And you can actually aggregate these genes, this is kind of Jeff Bland stuff, into different uh, therapeutic families. Uh, inflammation genes, lipid metabolism genes, vascular function genes, vascular smooth muscle proliferation genes, and coagulopathies. Those were the families of the 88 different genes that are all operationally modifiable based upon lifestyle meaning they have inducible characteristics, right? So it's influenced by the way we treat those genes and the information we send to them. So lastly, I said lastly, but this is truly lastly, um, is what about this other big enigma, the rising spectrum of Alzheimer's disease, cognitive dysfunction, one of the major, uh, obviously, concerns that we have with an aging population. You probably saw the cover of Scientific American in, uh, in March. And what did they talk about? They talked about the FINGER study, this Finnish geriatric intervention study to prevent cognitive impairment, in which they showed significant reduction in the appearance of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment over, t over life of time when individuals elected a personalized lifestyle intervention program. It may be the most powerful way that we're going to actually manage this condition. And that's, of course, and these are the data you can actually look at all, their, all different measurements of cognitive function were improved over time. And that's what our collaboration at IFM with Dale Bredenson and his uh, cognitive improvement program is all about, is finding ways to really operationalize these things so that they're not just theory. They're, uh, they're reduced to practice and they're studyable. We can actually quantify this and measure them. So with that, I thank you. I'll open up for questions and you've been very patient to allow me to move on. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. That was extraordinary. Kaleidoscope view of systems biology and functional medicines. Anybody have any questions?
When you sampled your blood for 25 years each quarter, what did you learn from then to now, and what did you find? Oh, that's a, that's a really interesting, quite important question. So um, just to give a quick answer, I was very uh, fortunate some, uh, probably 25 years ago, a, a guy wandered into our offices uh, at our research center, and, and uh, he had been, as a younger man uh, at the CDC, involved with setting up the blood parameters for the standard reference ranges for blood chemistries. And what he said was that the most significant thing they learned over the years of trying to establish those normal ranges that we all use in our, in our laboratory of, uh, studies was that it was not the value in and of itself. It was the trajectory of change that really was most important in determining a person's health. So it was serial change, deltas, right, changes in. So people that were high to begin with, if they stayed high, that was not as, uh, I'm talking about marginally high, uh, was not as important as if they, uh, they, were, they either went very low or they went very high over time. It's the change. It's the change in physiology. So what I learned was, because I've been measuring these things sequentially, was there are changes that we have in our physiology, even as we continue to stay on the program that we thought was healthy for us, that we needed to make modifications. So things start creeping, right? And then you have to iterate and change. So you can't say, well, I was doing fine on that program when I was 40. Well, what about when you're 50? And what about when you're 60? And what about when you're 70? So it's, it's making iterative changes. That's what I learned. It's not like I've got it locked in now. I know exactly who I am, and, and I'm going to stay on that program for the rest of my life. So it's, I think it's constantly interacting with this information base to, to tune up your program. Any other questions? Um, I want to get to the revolution in, in the paradigm um, because it seems to me going from statistics to the individual patient, from statistics to causation, you're doing three different things. First, you're throwing out risk factors. That's all statistically derived. So you have a totally new set of metrics. Uh, I want to see what the metrics are. Secondly, you're also throwing out randomized controlled trials. That makes that's wimpy science because that's statistics, not causation. And three, this has profound implications for reimbursement. If you're able to uh, use this new metrics and new theory to rectangularize, to use your phrase, that means you should pay the doctors and so on that are able to get you into the blue zone rather than the declining standard. <laughs> I, I think you've just done a fantastic job of more eloquently summarizing what I was trying to say in the last hour. So <laughs> that, uh, that was uh, that, those three points were the answer to why you, uh, I was trying to make my uh, my statements. So uh, yes, I think that the metrics we're using are changing based upon functional parameters, not just on pathophysiology based parameters. And by the way, interestingly enough, and all of us know this, that when cholesterol was introduced into the standard blood panel. It was the first time that a preventive analyte, there's no disease for which cholesterol is a diagnostic, right? It is a functional measurement of dyslipidemia, which associates with risk. But it associates with more than just risk. It associates with a whole series of other functions, like endocrine hormones, like bile acids. I mean, there's all sorts of interesting ways that that can be recast in a functional medicine model. So I think your point is very well taken. And lastly, pay for performance. It should be performance based upon improving function, not just changing numbers, right? And that, that's a whole nother discussion. But I think that is driven by information, right? That's where we're going. Aggregating information, this big, rich data cloud that's going to follow us, part of our electronic health record, not just medical record. There's a difference between a health record and a medical record, isn't there? It's more robust when you have a health record. So... I think that's, that's where we're heading. And the wearables, you probably saw that uh, Apple Computer just formed an agreement um, with this uh, company that is now producing for this first time continuous gluco mon glucose monitoring that will go to your Apple Watch, your smartwatch. And yes, it, right now it is invasive because you have to have this little wire inserted under your skin. But for diabetics, this is going to be life-changing. And, and as we get this to be non-invasive continuous glucose monitoring, which will happen, Think of what that means when a person looks down at their smartwatch and says, oh, my word, I just had stress. Look what happened to my blood sugar. Oh, I just ate that, that uh, you know, whatever it was, and I, gee whiz. Or I just uh, ate a really great diet and exercise, and man, look at my sugar. It's down right perfect. This is a reinforcing behavior in ways that we've never had 
uh, access to in the past. So these are tremendous paradigm-shifting technologies. They're not just fads. They're game changers for how we're all proceeding. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming to Cleveland, for being part of this, for inspiring us, and uh, making it all happen. I think you've got a little taste of the overview of functional medicine and how it intersects with the future of medicine and systems biology, and this is the future, and that's why we're here at Cleveland Clinic, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, so much.